Okay, so let's get started. So it's my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Megan Burke to our sales lecture series. And um, Dr. Megan Burke is one of our new hires in the philosophy department. We're very excited about that. So um, I wanted to invite her to this lecture so you get a chance to meet her and maybe take the class next semester. Uh, her classes are going really great this, this first semester. So um, let's uh, give her the, um, our attention. And, um, and then maybe I might say a little something at the end. OK, thank great. you. Thanks, John. Um, thank you all for being here. So I'm giving a talk called Life Without Gender, Rethinking Feminist Suspicion and Gender Neutrality. This is part of a project that I'm working on. So what I'm going to do today is just kind of introduce you to um, the problem and questions that I'm thinking about. Um, I'm going to leave it rather open-ended um, because there's a lot of terrain to cover. So what I'm going to do is just um, show you the kind of the social and political issues that I'm thinking through and the questions that are raised for me. So um, here's the big picture that I'm, that I'm thinking through, um, and that is that I see a tension between a central feminist philosophical claim, meaning a claim that is central to the field of feminist philosophy, and the recent emergence of new identities and experiences related to gender. So I am, I'm, I'm noticing a tension. I'm trying to understand um, what to do with this tension as a feminist philosopher myself. Um, this tension for me exposes something really important, um, and that is the way in which feminist philosophy as a field that is committed to thinking about questions of justice in relation to gender um, can also function as a force of exclusion um, to transgender and gender nonconforming individuals. So um, historically, the field of feminist philosophy takes its subject of concern um, and its political issue of concern to be the subordination and oppression of women. Um, but what we also have arise is tensions within feminist philosophy um, around other gender minorities, particularly transgender and gender nonconforming individuals. And so I'm trying to think about a contemporary tension that exists between the claims of feminist philosophy as about women and the oppression of women um, and a tension in which it denies the existence and experiences of other gender minorities. So my question is, Ought this tension be resolved by feminist philosophers? And I'll explain what that tension is more specifically in a moment. Um, and of course, I'm going to answer that question as an, with an affirmative yes, it ought. But then that leaves the question of how ought we resolve, resolve the tension. So before I get into some details about what that tension is that I'm seeing, I want to just lay out some key terms because I'm going to cover some um, terrain related to gender that might be new for many of us. Um, and so these are terms um, and definitions of terms I'm taking from the Transgender Education Student Resource Network. Um, and so the first, the first uh, term of concern for me is agender. And it's an umbrella term that encompasses different genders or different genders of people um, who commonly do not have a gender or have a gender that they describe as neutral. This is what I'm meaning by agender. Transgender or trans as a prefix, trans for short, is an umbrella term encompassing term of many, or many gender identities of those who do not identify or exclusively identify with their gender assigned at birth. This may or may not be agender people, as I'll talk about some agender people identify as trans and some do not, but trans is an umbrella term that encompasses people who do not identify as or exclusively with their gender assigned at birth. Um, cisgender or cis people is a descriptive term just like transgender or trans people that um, identifies people who exclusively identify with their gender they were assigned at birth. So for instance, say you were named a boy at birth and you take yourself to be a boy or a man today, then you are a cisgender man. If you were assigned boy at birth and you understand yourself to be a different gender, whether that is a woman or an agender person, then you are a trans person. Gender expression and presentation um, refers to the physical disclosure or manifestation of one's gender identity, often through visual cues such as clothing, hairstyle, voice. We all have gender expressions. Many of us do not consider them. Um, but part of uh, feminist uh, 
philosophy is to get us to think about our gender expressions and how they're related to systems of power, to questions of justice. We all have a gender presentation, all of us, every person, trans people, cis people, all of us have them. Gender nonconforming is a term that refers to people who do not follow other people's stereotypes or social norms related to gender. You can be cisgender person and be gender nonconforming. You can be a transgender person and be gender nonconforming. You can be a trans person and be gender conforming. A cis person and be gender conforming. So this is just a way to suggest that gender nonconforming <coughs> describes people who resist social norms and expectations about who men ought to be, what men ought to look like, what women ought to be, what women ought to look like. And then lastly, cis sexism is a systemic prejudice in the favor of cisgender people. So sexism is generally the social problem and political injustice that feminist thinkers and activists name as a systemic prejudice in favor of men. That would be sexism. Cissexism is systemic prejudice in favor of cisgender people. So that can be cis men or cis women. So here's a feminist, specific feminist claim I'm, I'm interested in, given um, all of these key terms I have just laid out. And that is the feminist claim, one in which I take to be important in, is that gender is a key structure of social and political life. Meaning gender names a phenomenon that structures our experiences of the world, gives us a sense of our identity, and is also a huge filter through which we perceive other people. I take this claim to be true as a feminist philosopher myself. So gender is a key structure of our lives. The second claim is that it's not just gender, it's a certain kind of gender, a binary gender norm that structures social and political life. And that binary gender norm is that there are masculine men and there are feminine women. And that is a binary gender norm that impacts all of us, even if we don't agree with it, and even if we don't live it out in our embodied lives. Related to these first two claims is that the absence of gender and the absence of the norm is impossible because both of them are structures of experience. They are institutional, they are systemic, we cannot escape them. We don't have a choice, they are there for us. We have a choice in how we navigate them, but they are already laid out for us. So therefore, because of these first three claims, there is no such thing as a gender neutral option. This is the claim that I'm interested in. There's no such thing as a gender neutral option. So as a result of, of this feminist claim, one I take to be very important, we have a kind of methodological and political imperative, meaning what ought we do with these claims. And that is the feminist claim is that we must consider the presence of gender when talking about human experience, the human condition, and the human realities. Gender is central to the questions that we ask and to the answers that we give. We cannot give genderless responses. So when we're talking about what it means to be human, we also have to ask, well, what does it mean to be a man and what does it mean to be a woman? And that's kind of the, this is kind of the, the way in which feminist philosophy defines itself as a distinctive field in philosophy. We can't ask questions about the human condition or what humans ought to do without asking questions about who men are and who women are and what men ought to do and what women ought to do in the social world. We have to ask those questions. So this is, the, this is where I'm starting from as some, someone who is a feminist philosopher and someone trained in a feminist philosopher is thinking that, well, the ge gender neutrality is not an option for us. Feminist suspicions then of gender neutrality are really central to feminist philosophy. So when we look at gender neutral terms either in the world or in the history of philosophy and we see terms like he or man, they are gender specific. They don't actually refer to humans. These weren't just errors made on the part of men writing philosophy. They're actually very gender-specific meanings when we read he, when we read man. 
So that means that when we're talking about human beings or persons, we can't actually speak of just human beings because they are differentiated socially, politically, economically, and personally by gender. So the suspicion then is that when, when we say as a society or when a philosopher talks about human beings, that something else is actually at work, that human beings ha already has a gendered referent. It refers to a gendered person already. Then there's another claim that happens in the interpersonal <coughs> sphere, um, and this is that, oh, I don't see gender. I don't see men or women. I just see human beings. And this is gender blindness. This also has a corollary when we're talking about race. Right? I don't see race. I don't see racial difference. I don't see color. The feminist claim in relation to gender is that no, all of us perceive gender, and that perception is a filter through which we respond to and interact with one another. So to say that one doesn't see gender um, is, in a sense, as I'll talk about, to live in bad faith, is to not perceive others through a central structure of our social world. So it's to ignore it altogether rather than to deal with what it does to us. The, the final feminist suspicion, which is perhaps one that is the most important, is that gender neutrality often operates as a guise for gendered power. So when we say, oh no, man actually, actually meant human beings, or human being, means, human being means everyone, the feminist claim is that historically, that is actually a way to perpetuate sexism. Because we're refusing to deal with the difference that gender makes in our lives. So there's deep suspicions when anyone makes a claim to gender, the gender neutral option from a feminist philosophical perspective. So these are the suspicions that I was trained to have, was trained to have these suspicions and to be suspicious about anyone making claims to perceive the world without gender. And indeed, in my own life, in my own self-reflection of thinking about how gender impact, impacts me, right, the training that I received suggested there is no moment in which I have a genderless experience. Even if I don't like what gender does to me, it is always with me. But then we see in recent years, particularly in the last five years, though arguably longer, we just not, have not had language to name it, we see individuals making claims to gender-neutral experience, genderless existence, and this is quite important. So people are staking claims to a genderless identity. And genderless experience, as it are, is articulated by such people, is becoming more visible, or at least making claims for it to be much more visible. So people making claims to genderless experience use various terms. Some of them are agender, androgynous, genderless, gender-free, gender-neutral, neutral, ungendered, and so forth. And oftentimes such people are also making claims to the use of gender-neutral pronouns, they, them, and theirs. These are various ways in which people are naming their own experience. Um, it was for me in, in a college classroom with younger students, um, LGBTQ students in particular, who were naming themselves in this way in which I was first um, became aware that this was a possibility. So some of this is generational, um, and this was interesting to me. And the more I started to listen to their experiences, the more it started to resonate with some of my own experiences as a queer gender nonconforming person. And I started to become interested in terms of what kind of access they had to new language and what they were trying to do with language to make sense of their experience. And then being trained as a feminist philosopher, I felt stuck because my training suggested that it is not possible to make those claims, and yet their claims resonated with me in such a deep way, and also such an interesting way, that they were trying to get more creative with what was possible to, to be and to do and to say in the world. But yet, as a philosopher, I wanted to make sense of this, and as a feminist philosopher, I wanted to make sense of how to make sense of being genderless in a very gendered world. Because if I were to not, I would just be saying to them, you are impossible. 
<laughs> and for me, that not only was ridiculous and arrogant, but it has also presented me with an ethical dilemma. So here's how we see genderless people appear more in the political world. Um, so Tyler Ford, August 7, 2015, um, a really famous uh, article in The Guardian, at least for those of us in the gender nonconforming trans and queer communities. Um, this is one of the first kind of visible public kind of uh, articles that we get on someone making a claim to being a gender. And then in 2016, Jamie Shoup becomes um, the first person in the state of Oregon to get the third gender marker on their license, making claims to a gender less than X existence. So this is also something that's happening in our social and political world. It's also something that then impacts all of us because now we have people socially and politically and legally changing the structure of gender. That, that will impact all of us in some ways. We will have to decide as a society what we want to do, how we want to support, if we want to support, how we will support people who want to make claims to a genderless existence. So if I'm taking this, the experience of my students, the way it resonates with me, the question it raises, and this social and political reality into consideration in light of my training as a feminist philosopher, lots of questions start to go off for me. Um, the first one that comes up is the, is the notion of bad faith. So I am kind of rooted in the existential phenomenological tradition. I often turn to Simone de Beauvoir, feminist philosopher, French feminist philosopher from the post-World War II era, to think through a lot of the questions that are raised for me about gender. Um, in The Second Sex, um, Beauvoir has and gives us an account of bad faith from a feminist perspective. So bad faith is a central kind of existential ethical notion in the field of existentialism. It's not not just Beauvoir who comes up with the idea, but in the second sex, she gives us a feminist account. And for Beauvoir, bad faith is the avoidance to recognize the oppression of women. And in that moment of avoiding the recognition of the oppression of women, one also avoids recognition and taking responsibility for the way gender structures our world. For Beauvoir, men live in bad faith, women live in bad faith. It takes work to perceive what gender does to all of us, and in particular to perceive the way gender is related to oppression. Most of us for Beauvoir flee that responsibility because it is much easier even as people are being harmed, even as women are being dominated, most of us refuse to recognize the reality. And instead, for Beauvoir, it's more comfortable for us to just assume the distinction between men and women is natural and that the differences in the lives between men and women are natural. That's what most of us do for Beauvoir because it is easier. We don't have to wrestle with the ethical obligations and realities it raises for us. Most of us live in bad faith. So for the feminist ethical aim then for Beauvoir is to recognize the oppression of women and to recognize what gender does to us. If we don't, we are living in bad faith. So when I think about this notion of bad faith and when I think about the way in which agender people, people who are living without gender are making claims to a genderless existence. It is very easy, and many feminists have argued that they are living in bad faith. It's not possible. I'm also a reader of trans-feminist philosophy. It's a very more under-read field. And in, tra in, in trans-feminist philosophy, there's a central notion of transphobia that is very distinct from the ordinary definition of transphobia as just a hatred and disgust with transgender people. Um, and that is transphobia should be understood as a basic denial of authenticity. This comes from trans feminist philosopher uh, Talia Mae Betcher, who is a professor in the Cal State system at Los Angeles. 
And for Betcher, the basic denial of authenticity gives us an account of how transphobia operates at very ordinary levels every day and at more violent levels in experiences, say, of violence and homicide against trans people. So the basic denial of authenticity is representing, naming, and speaking about trans people in ways that are at odds with trans people's identities. So here's what this sounds like. For Betcher, Betcher suggests that in a transphobic world, all trans people are positioned as either deceivers or pretenders. You are not really who you say you are. So in other words, X is really a Y. She is really a he. So if you are a trans woman, Betcher is suggesting, you will either be read as being a deceiver, you're deceiving everyone else and yourself, you are not really a woman, or you're pretending to be a woman. Because the only real women are cis women. For Betcher, this is generally how a cis sexist society, our society, treats trans people. You are really an X, even if you say you are a Y. For Betcher, positioning trans people as either deceivers or pretenders denies self-determination, meaning the ability to determine who you are, and first-person authority over identity. So here's how this would sound in the context of my own life. I'd say, I'm a gender non-conforming queer person, and someone would say, no, you're not, you're really a woman. And you're really a woman because you were assigned female at birth, and you had these experiences, and you're not a man, so therefore, regardless of who you say you are, we're telling you, you are a woman. That's the denial of self-determination. I don't get control, any control over who I am. And that you know me better than I know myself. So for Betcher, this is just general transphobia. It happens all the time, and it is a common feature of trans existence. So you can never be who you say you are. These views of trans identities as being inauthentic, so that's the denial of authenticity. Trans identities, trans experiences are always inauthentic. For, Bettler, for, for Betcher is the justification for violence against trans people. So I didn't really know they were so-and-so, and that just led me to do X to this person. This in, in the courtroom has often played out as the so-called trans panic defense. And I put defense in quotes because ethically I don't think it's a defense at all. It's an excuse for violence. But Betcher says this is often upheld as justification for treatment of trans people in a certain way. They lied to me. They didn't tell me who they were. And so therefore, it prompted me to do something I would have never done had I really known who they were. Transphobia. So this is an account that I'm reading and thinking about and trying to wrestle with how to make sense of the claim that a genderless person would live in bad faith, but that also a genderless person is being denied authority over their experience. How to make, this is the tension. How do we make sense of that tension in feminist philosophy? What do we do with that tension? Interestingly, very recently, so you have trans feminist philosophers who are trying to carve out space for trans and gender nonconforming people. Saying trans and gender nonconforming people are also gender minorities, just like women, <coughs> just like cis women. But interestingly, recently in a 2018 book by Jack Halbert Stam called Trans, we have, it, we have a trans and gender nonconforming feminist philosopher say the concept of being without gender, however, is whimsical at best. Since there are few ways to interact with other human beings without being identified with some kind of gendered embodiment. So now we have an emergence of the claim to bad faith within the context of trans feminist philosophy, which is a denial of experience 
by trans feminist philosophers, a very place where we might think we would expect or at least hope to find some room to understand and affirm a gender existence. So here are my claims. So this is the, the tension that I'm thinking through. This is the issues that I'm thinking through. So my claims are that to deny the possibility and the reality of agender experiences to perpetuate transphobia. I take that to be pretty self-evident, though others clearly don't. Feminist philosophy then ought not perpetuate transphobia because it is a realm of moral and political thought committed to justice in relation to gender and gendered power. So in my view, it is in bad faith for feminist philosophers and feminist philosophy as a field to perpetuate transphobia. So that means that feminist philosophy needs a new account of gender neutrality. And this is kind of where, where I am at today and trying to understand what that account looks like and how to articulate that. Because on the one hand, I do not want to deny that suspicion of gender neutrality ought to exist. I don't think we're over that yet. I think gender neutral option can still operate as a guise for sexism. But on the other hand, it is very clear to me that living without gender is a possibility for people. And it ought to be a possibility for people. And so how do we make room for both suspicion and affirmation? So that's kind of where I'm thinking about. We need a different account. We need to not just reject the gender neutral option. So I want to have a, a different kind of dialectical account between gender neutrality based on suspicion and affirmation that rejects gender blindness. And we must see gender. We must understand it as a structure. We must understand that we perceive one another through the lenses of gender and the gender norm. I think we need that. I think this is a very key feminist insight, that without that, we do not understand oppression, we do not understand the oppression of women, and we will also not understand the oppression of trans and gender nonconforming people. At the same time, so you don't see these as mutually exclusive, even though they are set up to be that way today, I think we can hold the suspicion and hold the moment of affirmation at the same time. I don't think these have to be in tension. So I also want to suggest that feminist philosophers must get better. So this is the ought, it is an ethical imperative, must get better at attending to affirming the possibility of living without gender and the end it as an option. And so this is kind of we need this account, we don't have it yet, and this for me is very curious and interesting. And so one of the, the tasks that, that remains, or at least many people have asked me for the task, is well, what does it mean to be a gender? Right? What does that mean? And that means a better practices of listening to what agender people are saying, right? Rather than telling others that it is an impossibility, there needs to be an epistemic space in which we learn about how others make claims to gender in new ways. So, thank you. Happy to take questions, yeah. Uh, I wonder how you would apply some of these principles, or if you think you could apply these principles, to the Rachel Dozo case, if we're pronouncing the name correctly, the woman who was born white and identified as black. Do you mm -hmm. think parallel arguments could be made for her case here? No, I would, I would hesitate to say that parallel arguments can be made about questions of gender and race because they are socially and historically, politically and economically very different phenomenon. They structure our lives in different ways. And so I would uh, not suggest that questions about trans experience, uh, transgender experience and transracial experience are parallel in any capacity. And so I would, would resist making any parallels based on what I'm doing here in terms of transracial experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Uh, earlier you said the colloquial uh, adoption of gender terms like man or something as the norm was a, uh, a way of systemic oppression uh, that just is kind of unseen in society and I was curious what you felt the ramifications of that were. Sure, yeah, great question. So there's tons of ramifications. Um, one of them is that it erases the experiences that women have and particularly the experiences that are unique to their oppression. So if we defer to men and men's experience, not only do we deny and erase that there are different experiences in the world, but we don't get any account of how those experiences are related to injustice. So that's one. The other one, which is of course related, is that we, we get one view of the world. We get a view of the world that's taken to be universal when it's actually partial. And so it gives us a very, a non-dynamic, very mono-dimensional view of the world. So even if you don't want to consider questions of justice and power, what we're saying is a universal account is actually very partial. And I think that's a very impoverished understanding of the world. Yeah. To follow up on that question, what then do you advise about historical documents that use man and mm. he in ways that sometimes it's easier to teach um, as if it's universal, but with our current understanding, how do we teach them as uh, representing a different worldview now without then becoming celebratory about the present? Yeah, that's such a great question. And I think one I often struggle with in teaching too. Um, for me, the question I ask, and I always raise it in the class, in the classes I teach are, who, who do we think is being spoken about? And what would we learn when we say, no, this is actually men being talked about? And what would we need to change about the account if we're really trying to be more inclusive? So I don't think that we should reject these texts that are about men, but I think we have to ask the question, right? As what does it mean if they are just about men? And if we don't want them to be just about men, is there anything we need to change about the accounts that we're being given? Question now. Uh, yeah. So doing like modern philosophy like now, like at this university, uh, how if you, I'm a little confused. I think you said that saying like they would not be okay because it kind of is blind towards different uh, men like gender uh, biases or uh, experiences. Is that right? Uh, that using they would not be okay. <laughs> So here's, what, so here's an example. So I was just uh, teaching um, Hobbes and Rousseau, social contract theory, in, in my social and political philosophy class yesterday. And both Hobbes and Rousseau are, are talking about men, talking about man. And so the question is, do we, are they really talking about humans? Are they really talking about men? Are they talking about all humans? Are they talking about specific men? If they're talking about specific men, then we need to take seriously what that says about what they're talking about, what the effects of it are. So in the case of social contract theory, um, if you're just talking about men, that, meant, that means only men can create legitimate political states. That matters. That means that their views about legitimate political power are predicated only on and for men. So we should point that out. It could be the case, though, that we want to say, well, we don't today, or maybe the, the communities that we're in or the classrooms that you're in, we don't believe that it's only men who should be able to contract into legitimate political power. We do believe that every human being, regardless of their gender, race, or class, or sexuality, should be able to be part of a political state. So if we want to adapt, I would say, say this would be an adaptation of Hobbes and Rousseau, we first need to attend to the first question. We can't just substitute in human. We have to take seriously first the very gendered phenomena happening in the text. But the later, but then the next thing would be a move. It would be a, a, an adaptation or interpretive move. If we want to say, well, they, they made an error, and so what we really want to do is put human being in there, then first we need to, to see if we can do that. Would it, would it hold the account up, right? 
But we have to do both. We have to make those moves. So it's not impossible, but if we don't do the first move, then I think we're living in bad faith. So we just can't rush to the gender neutral option. I think we have to sift through. And of course, it's also the case, right? Um, uh, someone was asking too, well, are we talking about men who own slaves? That's, another, that's an important question. We can't, I don't think we can just overlook these historical realities. We have to pay attention to them in order to understand the meanings that are being offered to us, the arguments that are being offered to us, and then we might be able to adapt them. Or maybe we might realize that we need to ditch them. I think we have to get through it first rather than jump over it. So I've got a, yeah. a comment. Um, so we've been using uh, bad faith kind of in a strictly, um, uh, in its strictly historical context and then, then maybe using it in a more broader context as well. And it seems so far that what you've suggested is that bad faith can get us into a position where we are improperly categorizing trans and, and therefore it becomes transphobic to accept that as a, as a, as a way of, uh, as a philosophical tool. But then you've also used it as a way of, of supporting your argument. So, so I, I'm thinking like a, a number of different ways that we're using bad faith. Um, what, what's, what, what, what are you trying to do with that term? Yeah, so I think what I'm trying to, so on the first, the first way I'm considering bad faith is really the feminist claim about we must perceive gender else we're fleeing our responsibility mm -hmm. to the world. So I think generally all of us are living in bad faith in relationship to this. Because I think it is easier to avoid perceiving gender and gender oppression. So, I'm, so this is kind of the, the starting point. But then there's a bad faith in terms of also the way in which transphobia operates. So there's, there's a bad faith in a cis-sexist society. That, that bad faith is denying self-determination. And I think that that is also bad faith because we're fleeing our responsibility to complicate our field of gender. And I think it's in bad faith to do that as well because that perpetuates an ethical harm. Mm -hmm. And that can happen, that happens within and among feminist philosophers. It's also happening among trans feminist philosophers and it's happening among more general populations. So I think it's both. So I'm trying to suggest it's in, in both ways. And I think they're both related in the sense that bad faith in relationship to gender, whether it's the refusal to recognize gender or the refusal to complicate our field, is all about denying the reality of gender as complicated and nuanced and central to our lives. Yeah, Dan. Uh, so on this bad faith topic, it makes me think about this case in which, um, I can't remember his name, but it was like in 2006 or so, uh, Colonel goes in for a um, job at the Library of Congress, where like his, he was like uh, expert in uh, spy stuff, and so he's like perfect for this job. Mm -hmm. And the woman who hires him like sees that and mm -hmm. offers him the position. He accepts it. A week before he takes the position, he he informs her that he's going to be taking the position as a um, woman, mm -hmm. and. Um, so I'm thinking she ends up retracting the offer, and then there's a lawsuit which she ended up winning. But I'm thinking about is she like guilty of like double bad faith in the sense that she's being discriminated towards a trans individual, but also by denying um, that a woman can have uh, expertise in the particular subject that the man was uh, supposed to have had. Hmm. I'm not familiar with this yeah, yeah particular case, so I, I would hesitate to make a kind of final absolute <laughs> judgment on that. But it sounds as if the what you're what you're offering as as you're describing it to me would suggest there's kind of complicated moments of bad faith happening. I mean, certainly the case that trans women are subjected to is a particular form of misogyny, trans misogyny, that kind of undermines their own epistemic authority um, in different ways. And so that would be like a, that would be a heavy moment of bad faith. 
but I, I'm, I don't know. I can't speak to this because I, don't, I hesitate to speak on things I'm not super clear on. So I would say that I would want to, I would use the lens. I mean, I think that the question's fascinating and I'll be interested to go look it up. Yeah. Yeah. What's your thoughts on like transgender women competing in like female sports? Because I know there was an incident in the MMA where uh, mm -hmm. he, the transgender woman almost killed a female in the MMA ring. Sure. I think that our publicity around trans athletes really focuses on exceptional cases. So my general comment is that um, among all people, there are variations in hormones. And most of us are very focused on the high levels of testosterone that allegedly exist in trans women. Generally, medically, this is not the case. Athletes have high levels of testosterone across the board, all athletes. Many cis women have higher levels of testosterone than cis men who are not athletes and on par with cis men who are athletes. So these would be, say, women who are assigned female at birth who compete as female athletes have huge, high, very high levels of testosterone. We're not concerned about them. We are concerned about trans women who are on estrogen to lower their testosterone at rates lower often, but not always, than cis women whose testosterone levels are high. So I would say that our social and cultural panic around hormones and trans athletes is related to a panic around gender, um, that gender is somehow natural. So I would suggest that when we see um, representations of trans athletes in the media as, as how this is so harmful to an equal playing field, we're getting a very sensationalized image of trans athletes. And so I would, just ca I would, I would hesitate. I would caution all of us to hesitate on those judgments because being an athlete raises your testosterone for everyone. And trans athletes in particular are on medical regulated hormone treatments to either elevate their estrogen if they are trans women, so lower their testosterone, or if they are trans men, to elevate their testosterone. So I would just hesitate about the panic around trans athletes. Yeah? Uh, you said that because there are agender people in the human relation, feminist philosophy has to make a new account of uh, what, what to do with gender. Mm -hmm. um, is, there, is there like a, like a beginning of that? Is there, is there like a, something sprouting from that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for decades, um, transgender studies has been offering accounts of gender that exceed those offered by feminist philosophers. But feminist philosophers generally have not been paying attention. And this is interesting. This is a kind of a moment of an epistemic denial, of a denial of knowledge that exists outside of a field when it's speaking to your field. So there, for decades, there have been people offering more complicated, nuanced accounts of gender. And yet the question is, where are they in feminist philosophy? There, are, there have been a few feminist philosophers. Talia Betcher is one of them, a trans feminist philosopher, who have been slowly pushing. Um, but it's really only been in the last few years where there is anything such as trans philosophy starting to emerge. And this is by trained philosophers who have long studied um, debates and questions and issues in trans studies, trying to push and make room in the field. So it's really recent, and yet for decades, there's a whole body of literature that is available having these conversations. And that's, that's an interesting moment um, to think about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've heard from feminists and other feminist philosophers that have a genuine distaste for the term feminist itself just because it has the them in the beginning and I feel as though that term can feel exclusionary because it's a movement that wants everyone to be equal not a feminine person to be above anyone else. Would you feel that maybe like in the redefining of gender there should also maybe be a redefining of feminist or a new term for this movement or I have no problem with the term feminist. Um, I, in fact, I would question people's problems with the term feminist because I hesitate to deny a focus on women. I think we don't live in a society, we've never lived in a society that focuses on women. And I think this is profoundly important. 
So people who have a distaste for the term feminist because it references women, for me, is, is misogynist. And that can come from men, that can come from women, and so I hesitate to suggest we need a new term. For me, feminism as a field of thought and even as a social and political movement is the place where we get a good critical account of what happens to all of us in relation to gender. I don't want to throw that out just because it's come from women. I think that that's actually really important to hold on to. It matters when people who are marginalized speak and how they name themselves and to throw out that language I think is, is a problem. But I want to complicate it. I think that's the kind of move that I'm asking for. Yeah. So I had a question about what you mean by we're all guilty of bad faith. Mm -hmm. Because that seems like kind of accusatory. I mean, I, I, I know it wasn't intended that way, but I, like, is there something that like a lot of us are missing that makes it so that we're like, mm -hmm. like behind the scenes kind mm -hmm. of, of like guilty of bad faith or something that we like yeah. bluntly deny? Yeah, it is quite, it is somewhat accusatory. I won't deny that. Um, and I think Beauvoir meant it in this way too. It's not necessarily willful, right? We're not all willing bad things to happen to one another. So it's not accusatory in the sense is that all of you go out in the world and you're bad people. So it's not accusatory in that way. But for Beauvoir, and this is really the account I'm drawing on, is that we are all socialized in, in particular ways that make us ignorant of social structures and injustice. And that leaves us all in a situation of bad faith. And so part of the, res the ethical work that we all have to do is to take responsibility for the situation around us rather than kind of naively right, and ignorantly work through it. And that exceeds gender. This is about really for Beauvoir all forms of injustice. Um, and so some of the work so this is why I find uh, feminist philosophy to be a really important field. It's trying to do that work to wake us up, to get us to perceive differently. So that's what I mean why we're all living in bad faith, and that's not necessarily our fault. But Beauvoir's suggestion is that that is our situations. We have to, take, we have to find some way to take responsibility for it. Yeah. Yeah, I was wondering if you could say something about the difference of these issues for trans uh, gender people and agender people. Transgender people don't necessarily have to deny gender as, as an issue. They just want, I mean, they want to keep the, stru the social structure. They really, they just want to be in a different place in it, mm -hmm. right? So whereas agenders, most of the dilemmas you were talking about, particularly at the end, I think, dealt with the fact that agender people are trying to basically deny the existence of gender in some sense, you know, and, and so that's something that needs to be dealt with. But that's not necessarily a problem for transgender people, right? I mean, they're actually acknowledging that gender is a social construct. They just want to have a different place for themselves in that social construct. Well, I don't, so, yeah, it's an interesting point. I would has, I would, I'm very hesitant to say that transgender people want this and mm -hmm. feel this way, and agender people want this and feel this way. Because transgender people are a very heterogeneous, diverse group of people. They want different things, understand the realities in different ways. Some agender people identify as trans and some don't. So I don't think that it's uh, a good and I, I would never say that transgender people want this and agender people want that. It certainly is the case that there are binary trans people. So there are some trans people who are making claims to gender as cis people would make claims to gender. And so the difference between agender people and cis and trans people right, cis and trans people who are making a claim to gender is that agender people are making no claim. That is, that is the difference, but that's not a specific difference between trans and agender people. That's a difference between people making no claim to gender and people who are. My understanding of a, the affirmative account of agender experience is that these are people not denying gender. It's a negotiation of a social world saturated with gender that doesn't make sense to you and who you are. And that's not a denial of gender. That's taking very seriously that your world is structured in a way and that you have a different experience of that world. Mm -hmm. There's a question up here. No? Mm -hmm. Okay, that takes us to where we are out of time for this week. So let's give.